Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Another Place, Another Time, Chapter 11, Flying the Black Flag. The war was over, but U-190 was still at sea, although my days as an active Kriegsmarine officer were shortly to draw to a close. The best description of these days is contained in my wartime diary, which I began to keep again as soon as I learned the war in Europe had ended. It reads, May 11th, 1945. After 11 weeks at sea, we are on our way back to our homeland. For weeks we have lost radio contact with our country. Only American stations can be heard and they leave no doubt about the hopelessness of our situation. An uncontrollable urge drives us home. The uncertainty is unnerving. We have now been submerged for nearly 50 days and we try again and again to take the boat as close as possible to the surface to perhaps receive some instructions. Finally, finally we pick up a somewhat garbled message from High Command. It orders us to surface, to set a black flag, to throw overboard all our ammunition and to wait for further orders. So, this is it. The bitter end. Shortly after midnight, we are again at a depth of 60 meters, the officers meet to discuss the situation. It is not easy to follow these last orders and to deliver our battle-proven boat to the Allies. We ponder all kinds of options. Scuttling the boat, Spain, South America, Germany, nothing is a viable solution. We will, after all, obey, as always. The captain calls the crew together into the Zentrale and makes a short speech explaining the situation. Then, he says, At 0900, at dawn, we will surface. Everybody will have packed his basic necessities and be ready to abandon ship. Any questions? Silence. Dismissed. Again, we sit in the wardroom and talk about non-important matters. The mood is tense. Artificial gallows humor helps to overcome the bitterness of the situation. Then, it's time for our preparations. The second watch officer, Leutnant Müller, stows all secret books, papers and matters in bags and weighs them down with heavy objects. They are destined to go overboard. The torpedo artificer prepares his eels for firing. Ammunition is being lugged to the centrale and the men are busy collecting their belongings. I find myself standing around somewhat helplessly as I don't quite know what to do with myself. Joining the others in packing my things? Abandoning what has been my world for more than a year? The full meaning of the events has not sunk in yet. At 0855 the order comes. Diving stations. Slowly I raise the boat to periscope depth. The captain takes a look around and then says... Ready to surface. The order is passed on throughout the boat. While I am contemplating that this will be my last surfacing maneuver ever and therefore the end of my career as a U-boat engineer officer, responses are coming in from both ends. Ready to surface. I report to right. Lower deck, ready to surface. Starboard diesel. Surface, now. With maximum revolutions, the propellers start to churn and the boat shoots upwards. I order, blow, and report 12 meters, boat rises, 10 meters, 8 meters, 6 meters, bridge is clear, blow out with diesel. Slowly the engines turn over and then fire up and I leave the rest to my engineer in training. I climb the ladder up to the bridge, bright sunshine and a leaden sea. For the first time in 83 days we see daylight but the light is far too intense and hurts our eyes. The first bags with secret material arrive on the bridge. One bursts while hitting the water and, shining brightly, the red confidential books float on the surface. The captain curses. The torpedoes are reported ready. They are expected to go down and sink immediately after launching, nothing more. The first watch officer fires one after the other and shortly thereafter heavy detonations rock the boat. Once, twice, three, four and five. I shout down the conning tower. Check all valves and bilges. After a short pause, there is the report. All valves tight and bilges dry. Well, we just missed sinking ourselves. The torpedo artificer is called to the bridge. Right barks. How in hell was this possible, man? After some discussion, we come to the conclusion that the pressure of the very deep water must have blown up the batteries and then, in turn, the warheads. Two sailors inflate our rubber boats. One never knows whether some allied aircraft might try and collect some last laurels. In the meantime, our radio operators are trying to establish contact with the homeland. Again and again they call, but no success. Nobody seems to hear us. 
We are now southeast of Newfoundland and will continue on our course to Norway, as long as they let us. The off-duty crew slowly assembles on the bridge and soaks up the beautiful sunshine. What a sight they are. Their faces seem to be green and yellow. The long lack of fresh air does leave its traces. The lovely weather, however, helps to raise our spirits a little. One sailor plays the accordion, all those familiar German songs we won't hear for some time to come. Our flag is still flying proudly from its staff at the aft end of the bridge, and with a bit of imagination we could be on a training cruise in the Baltic. In the afternoon the last crates with ammunition go overboard, and still nothing to see or to hear. At 5.30pm Rogge and I are having dinner, with a few cognacs to aid the digestion, when our radio operator establishes contact with the outside world. Unfortunately, it is not the homeland that answers, but Cape Race in Newfoundland. In English language, we are given new coordinates to steer to. We jump to the chart. It is Newfoundland. We are now enthusiastic. We have had quite enough cold during the last months. Well, let's enjoy the sunshine while it lasts, since in two days we will be once again within the ice limits. On the bridge again, I notice that the sun has moved from starboard to port. We are on our new course, destination Newfoundland. It will take us about three or four days. The news we receive from American radio stations affect us deeply. We learn that Germany is to be divided into parts, each to be occupied by one of the Allied powers. We could not know it at the time, but on May 11th, after receipt of our radio message giving the position and course of U-190, the Canadian corvette HMCS Thorlock and the frigate HMCS Victoria will were ordered to leave the convoy they were escorting just off the coast of Newfoundland and to proceed to our reported position. According to Canadian naval records, these two ships spotted our navigation light at 11.05 p.m. on May 12, 1945, and their arrival quickly became known on board our boat, as I describe below. May 12, 1945. Midnight. I had just lain down on my bunk when I wake up to a slight touch on my shoulder. Herr Oberleutnant, lights ahead. Out of the bunk, into my boots and up to the bridge, it's all one easy move. It is pitch black. I asked Rogge. Herbert, what's up? He points ahead. There, the shadow. He signaled. Seems to be a destroyer. Slowly my eyes adjust to the dark. Through the binoculars I see the faint outlines of a vessel. One funnel, I hear the first watch officer say. Wright appears on the bridge, ready to receive, white cap on his head. Our engines have stopped. The ship is now quite close. Suddenly, a searchlight brightens the night, crawls along the water surface, catches us in its beam and is switched off. Blinded, we stare into the darkness which has returned. Again the searchlight comes on, but illuminates its own bow. Now we see a cutter emerge from the other side of the ship, manned by about 15 sailors. We observe them row the boat over to us. All are wearing steel helmets. Slowly the cutter approaches. Now we recognize the gold rings of an officer. Riot orders some sailors down to the deck to assist the boat as it awkwardly comes alongside. Our men help the visitors onto our deck. Our bridge is immediately occupied by heavily armed men and some climb down the conning tower into the boat. An enemy naval officer appears on the bridge and asks, Where is the commanding officer? Our CO identifies himself and the officer, also with the rank of lieutenant, requests Wright to accompany him down into the boat. The CO in turn asks me to come with him. First watch officer, you stay here, he tells Rogge. Down below, the foreign sailors have spread out over the boat. A big chain hangs down from the bridge into the centrale. It seems they don't trust our peaceful intentions and suspect we may dive away with them. They are Canadians and apparently don't feel all that comfortable in their new environment. Wright shows the Canadian officer to his quarters. I just stand by and happen to see the second watch officer and engineer in training crawl out of their bunks, still half asleep and with surprise on their faces. With the help of an English-German questionnaire, the Canadian officer poses a few questions and gives a few instructions. He inquires about our weapons and ammunition, but he answers right away himself. Thrown overboard, I'm sure. We confirm. Our handguns are still in our possession and he collects them immediately. I'm quite angry with myself that I didn't throw mine overboard as well. We are told that an armed guard will remain aboard and that we are not to use our radio transmitter. We didn't have any doubt about that. The CO in the meantime has offered his guest a cognac and so we drink to our mutual health. The Canadian then wants to light a cigarette but that we cannot permit down here. Apparently there are some doubts about what to do with us since nothing is happening. 
All of us go back to the bridge and smoke our cigarettes in silence. Suddenly, the second watch officer reports a second vessel abeam on port and soon another cutter comes alongside. Several officers climb aboard, among them a very energetic red-haired lieutenant who confers with his ship by way of portable radio and who, after much pandemonium, finally creates order. He asks me how many men I need to operate the boat. I don't quite understand and reply, all of course. He explains that he is only talking about the three days we will need to take the boat to Newfoundland and also informs me that the Canadians will provide navigation and deckhands. After some consultation with one of my chief petty officers, we arrive at six technicians for the engine room, three sailors for the engine telegraph and rudder, and also my two chief petty officers. We are told that all other men and all officers are to leave our boat and transfer to the Canadian ships. Upon my question, for how long, the answer is, take necessary items for three days. I go down below to pack. Next door in the CO's quarters, there's quite a commotion. Even with help from a sailor, Riot has difficulties first deciding what to take and then to find ways to carry it all. While I'm waiting for him, a few Canadian officers have joined me, among others a rather hefty engineering lieutenant with glasses who seems to be cordiality in person. He is perspiring just from watching our CO, but then it is really hot down here inside the boat. The Canadian smiles and makes a pitying gesture in the direction of Wright. I can only shrug. In the meantime, our energetic officer in charge has become rather impatient and he leaves no doubt about his feelings in his request to the CO to hurry up. But Wright doesn't even notice since he is far too busy trying to convince a Canadian sailor that all these things are his private property, although the Canadian is not interested, nor does he understand. Finally, we make it up to the bridge. All our officers are already sitting in one of the cutters, the CO and I board the other one. Hardly have I sat down when the Canadians order me back aboard. They have decided to keep me on the boat and I'm happy about that change. Well, here I am with 11 German sailors, 5 Canadian officers and about 25 Canadian sailors aboard our U-boat and all waiting for things to happen. The two cutters with our crew have disappeared into the darkness. All of a sudden, I find it difficult to suppress a chuckle. I poke one of my chief petty officers and point to our flagstaff. There flies, of course, the white ensign, the flag of the Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy, but on top of the staff sits still our brass eagle clasping the swastika. A most peculiar combination. Smoking again one of the cigarettes offered by the Canadians, they taste great by the way, I talk to our guests about terminology for boat speed and maneuvering. As none of the Canadians understands a single word of German and as I have forgotten most of my school English, it isn't simple. Thanks to the existence of a nautical dictionary, we manage somehow to communicate. Having clarified the issue, I request our diesels and soon, after a three-hour interruption, they again roar to life. I'm still standing on the bridge and contemplate with sadness the changed circumstances of my life. My comrades are somewhere aboard Canadian warships and I am on our boat with a Canadian crew and feel rather lost. The Canadians are quiet too and may have similar thoughts. If we had met only 24 hours ago, it would have meant it's either you or us. Each side would have done the utmost to destroy the other. And now we sit together peacefully on our bridge, smoking cigarettes, listening to music from our record player and thinking, the war is over. I go down below and have somebody make coffee. On a walk through the boat I look at my men. Thank goodness I can't see a sign of depression. All are standing straight at the engines, full of self-confidence with an expression on their faces telling the rather helpless looking Canadians, what do you know about running a U-boat? Without us, you wouldn't get very far, despite your big pea shooters. Some efforts at humor on my part result in a grin on their faces, making the Canadians even more unsure of themselves in their strange surroundings. The boat is one big mess. The hasty departure has left its traces. In the officers' quarters, I make an effort to clean up a bit and put cups and saucers and cookies on the table. Back on the bridge, I invite the officers down to a steaming cup of real coffee. The engineering lieutenant and two of the other officers follow me happily down the conning tower. The smell of the coffee creates a peaceful mood. The hot liquid warms us up. We get to know each other a bit and I find my former enemies are rather nice guys. Very politely they inquire where they may sit down and express their thanks for anything I have to offer. They pay me compliments for my fragmented English and make every effort to speak slowly so that I can follow. Main topic is, of course, the war at sea. 
They are amazed that we have been at sea for more than 80 days and that we have spent almost the last 50 submerged without any interruption. They admire the boat and its equipment. Engineering officer Dean is particularly full of praise. The conversation drifts to personal matters. The first question is whether I'm married. I answer no and add that I just turned 22 two months ago. I show them some photographs and Lieutenant Webb asks me for a small passport picture of myself. I learn that they are all reserve officers as are most officers of the Canadian escort ships. Most of them are former university students. Two of the officers take their leave and relieve the watch on the bridge. Now Lieutenants Burbage and Sterling enjoy the coffee. The cognac they all refuse. I put on a record of Die Fledermaus and, of course, they know it too and request all of the other Strauss records as well. Gradually we get tired. Some of the officers lay down for a sleep and I play a game of chess with Webb. I win easily and tell him that it's probably a bit late for this game. My watch still shows German time and I reset it to Newfoundland time. It's now 4 o'clock in the morning. After a short sleep I wake up again and climb up to the bridge. The sea has become rough. It is bright daylight with clear visibility. To port is the frigate Victoria Will and to starboard the corvette Thorlock, some distance away. We are a beam of each other and cruise at 11 knots. I talk with the Canadian officers about anything and everything and am amazed how well we can communicate. Obermachinist Krüger also tries to utilize his knowledge of English acquired on many long trips. He is, though, rather busy flipping the pages of his dictionary and less so in actual talking. I learn that Lieutenant Blackford, who was the first officer to come aboard, is from the Thurlock, whereas all the others are from the Victoriaville. The hours of the morning pass quickly with much laughter about various misunderstandings. The flagstaff has now been changed. After lunch the sea gets pretty rough and the first breakers come through the open hatch. I equip the Canadians with wet weather gear while I myself withdraw into the comfort of the boat. Webb loses the return chess match too. One of my mates reports that one of the Canadians didn't close the appropriate valves in our toilet so that our aft compartment slowly but surely started to fill with seawater. Now my men are busy pumping the water out of the boat again. It's rather ironic when, a short time before I blew out our diving tanks, a periodic routine, I suddenly felt the muzzle of a rifle in my ribs. One of the Canadian sailors obviously didn't trust me and didn't want to see me scuttle the boat. We lose a cylinder on our port diesel. I tell my men to ignore it as we'll get to Newfoundland on eight cylinders just as well. Our low pressure air system is also out of service and will remain so. On my inspection of the boat I notice the growing understanding between the Canadians and our men. With the help of gestures and sign language they carry out a lively conversation. In the Zentrale the officers admire our Zeiss binoculars and admit that their own don't compare. One of the officers is full of praise for his Kine Exacta camera and overall they are all quite willing to acknowledge positive German achievements. During a conversation between the German and Canadian sailors, in which I function as well as I can as interpreter, a Canadian petty officer replies to my question as to the general opinion in Canada about Germany with Oh, the German people are very clever, but the Nazis, and illustrates his meaning with a throat-cutting gesture. I tell him that we are all Nazis since National Socialism did a lot of good for our country in the years before the war. He doesn't believe me and insists that all Nazis are criminals, whereas we here are really easy to get along with. And with respect to the anti-German hate-mongering in the press, well, that's the way newspapers make a living and few reasonable Canadians are taken in by it. When the conversation gets to discussion of the present situation in Germany, the same petty officer suggests to Krüger that he should remain in Canada. It would be quite easy for him to get a job in his factory. And my family? asks Krüger. They follow, of course. The next morning, May the 13th, 1945, I noticed that my medals and ribbons have disappeared from my uniform jacket which was hanging in the radio room. Shortly thereafter, my two chief petty officers report the same. Their shoulder straps have also been cut off their jackets. I immediately complain to Lieutenant Sterling, a very nice young man, who is sitting at the table in the officer's wardroom area. He is visibly disturbed by this discovery and promises to stop the quest for souvenirs by his men at once and assures me that everything taken will be returned. Very soon I see several of the officers questioning and searching their men. It's quite a commotion, but by the next day all the missing items are neatly lying on the table in the wardroom. 
Lieutenant Sterling expresses his regrets and continues to apologize for the behavior of his men. He complains about having to go to sea with sometimes less than virtuous men, but during wartime one can't be too choosy. He still looks very unhappy after he notices my apparent lack of understanding, but deep down I'm actually rather amused and smiling about his eagerness. Another incident occurred that caused the Canadian officers much anguish. After our party beneath the sea, our sailors had apparently poured the remainder of their alcohol supplies into their canteens. The canteens had stayed behind after their owner's hasty departure and I was not aware of their contents. At one time, I noticed that most Canadian sailors had a German canteen hanging from their belts and didn't think very much about it until I heard a Canadian petty officer suddenly yell at the top of his voice at some of his men who he had found lying in the bow torpedo compartment in a state of happy contentment and not quite sober. The interest of the Canadian sailors in requisitioning our canteens became quite understandable to me. The temptation had been irresistible. The Canadian officers now become very strict with their men and voluntarily promise me that each and every one of their sailors will be subject to a body search upon leaving our boat. With the increasingly heavy weather, it has become very, very cold. We have passed the ice limits and the effects are felt by all. It is close to freezing point and everybody digs up some woolies from somewhere. The Canadian supervision has become rather slack and automatic rifles and bayonets are hanging everywhere around the boat. We are hardly watched at all anymore. The difference in appearance between our own and the Canadian sailors is very notable. The Canadians look a bit disheveled, shirts hanging out front or back, left foot a slipper, right foot a shoe, tears in their not very clean clothing. Our men, on the other hand, make a tremendous effort to look neat and clean, but only since the time our guests have arrived. In the afternoon we reduce speed so as to arrive at our destination just at daybreak. Later we even stop for a while. We are close to land now and when darkness falls there are some lights visible ashore. Once again Webb, Sterling, Dean and I are on the bridge in a somewhat romantic mood in the moonlight, stars in the clear sky and listening to recorded music recalling homeland, family and shore leave. It is nice and reflective but terribly cold. The hours pass by and only shortly before dawn on May the 14th 1945 do I lie down for some sleep. Soon after I am being awakened again by one of our sailors. Hoberleutnant, how about it? He is holding a whole plate full of gorgeous smelling bratwurst under my nose. I am enthusiastic. There is peak activity in our galley as all our men are being generously supplied out of our leftover stores. I don't take the time to find fork and knife but, with a sausage in one hand and a piece of bread in the other, I gorge myself in the galley with an amazing appetite. I finally decline an offer of a fourth serving. I am full. Lieutenant Burbage comes down from the bridge and looks longingly at our meals and of course he is invited to participate. He and his fellow officers are surprised how well we still live on our boat, much better than they expected. A can of delicious peaches concludes our feast. Sometime later, climbing up to the bridge, I note that we are entering a large bay surrounded by mountains. In the distance, for the first time, I see some huge icebergs. The two escorts are circling around us. Ahead, there are some patrol boats, like our own airboater. We have arrived in Bay Bulls, Newfoundland. Dean and I have some discussion concerning the upcoming maneuvers. The Canadians are not familiar with our engine telegraphs and procedures. Answering a question, I point out the rather difficult maneuvering characteristics of a submarine. Close to the entrance of the harbor, we stop the diesels. One of the couplings has almost seized up and, lacking our low-pressure air system, it takes quite some time until the electric motors start humming. More and more small craft are circling our sub. A motorboat with a group of photographers aboard comes quite close. There is a girl on board and I must have stared a bit too intensely as Burbage feels inclined to smile and drop a teasing remark. I explain, first girl in three months. He nods understandingly. The boat comes alongside and a group of officers and sailors dressed in immaculate blue uniforms come aboard. One of the officers speaks some German and has spent some time in Germany. He also is a submariner and takes over the command from Lieutenant Burbage. He shows me a chart and points to the buoy where the boat is to be moored. I suggest carrying out the maneuver myself and he agrees. With Boat Smart Vele at the helm I now execute my first and my last mooring maneuver with U190. We still have to pass a net barrier, then we are in the inner harbor. The surroundings leave a godforsaken impression. A few wooden shack-like houses are perched on the rocks and the harbor area looks just as primitive. Our two escorts have already tied up at a wooden pier. 
We are now close to our mooring buoy. Canadian sailors are on deck to handle the lines. Both engines have stopped and we glide slowly towards the buoy. Both engines half astern. Once again, the waters are churning around our stern and then both engines stop. Final stop. Boat is tied up. Dismissed from stations. No more ready for action ever. Assemble on deck. The last war patrol of U-190 has finished and it was quite different from our expectations 85 days ago on our departure from Germany. The war was over and I was fortunate to survive it, particularly after I learned the fatality statistics for the U-Boat Waffe. They were chilling. Of the more than 40,000 men who served in that branch of our Navy between 1939 and 1945, 28,000 were killed. I had done my best to serve my country in time of war, but looking back more than half a century later, I think that perhaps my proudest achievement was to help ensure that the 57 officers and sailors of U-190 survived that awful conflict. And with this, the war is over for our author. There are a few pages left in the book, so don't worry, we'll know what happens after the surrender. Again, I find it incredible how two warring factions immediately become friendly towards each other after the hostilities cease. Just hours before, like Werner says, both sides would have used everything in their power to kill the other, but now they treat each other with utmost respect. Also of interest in this episode, the Bratwurst. The regulars know what happens now. For all the new listeners, welcome to Kitchen Diaries. Now, the Bratwurst is one of my favorite types of sausage in the German kitchen. Bratwurst literally means fried sausage, betraying its intended means of preparation. It is a staple of German barbecue, especially East German barbecue, which I know by heart since that is where I'm from. The Bratwurst is meat chopped and minced to varying degrees, as well as spices, all stuffed in a pig's intestine and then grilled. It is served with a variety of sides like the famous sauerkraut or in a bun with mustard as a quick snack. There are various types of bratwurst, some say more than 40, but as an expert I can tell you that there is only one true type and that is the so-called Thüringer bratwurst, the Thuringian sausage. I have consumed countless sausages of all varieties in my time. Yes, yes, make your jokes, go ahead, let me know, write them in the comments. And like I said, the Thuringian variant reigns supreme. If you ever come to Germany, you must have one with loads of mustard. Alternatively, you can have one with mashed potatoes and sauerkraut. That is fine too. That being said, this is it for this episode. Thank you for watching. Consider subscribing and I will see you in the next episode. Cheers.